Thanks. Are the lights going to stay this bright? It makes me feel self-conscious. OK. Um, all right. So um, if I get up and pace nervously, don't, don't be alarmed. I'll probably do it. Um, oh wait, hold on. Where'd it go? All right. So I wrote this book, um, which is part of the reason why I'm here. Um, the book's called Chaos Monkeys. This is the American cover. If you go look for it in a, uh, in a bookstore, it won't look like this. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the Limeys, or I think the Pommies, as you call them, um, picked a hideous cover for the UK Commonwealth edition um, and uh, completely changed um, the, the actual cover. I usually wear these pants on a Chaos Monkey event because it matches the, the green on the, uh, the cover, and unfortunately, it throws off my game in any other country. Um, in any case, uh, I, out of curiosity, and, and I expect to see a lot of hands in a crowd like this, does everyone here actually know what a Chaos Monkey is? Who, sorry, who knows what a Chaos Monkey is? It's okay if you don't. Wow, I expect to see more hands. Okay, so a chaos monkey, um, picture a monkey running crazy through a, a, a server farm, literally punching boxes, pulling on cables, etc. cetera. Um, a chaos monkey is actually a, a diagnostic tool that was, um, someone start the clock, by the way, it's not ticking, um, is, um, is a tool that was actually outsour open sourced by Netflix. And what it does is, what they do is they basically nuke different boxes inside their server farm. And then they, they test and see if like House of Cards can still stream or whatever, right? And um, the reason why I named the book after that, which is, by the way, the question that everybody asks, um, is because I use it as a metaphor for, for Silicon Valley. Uh, how so? Um, somebody like Travis Kalanick at Uber um, you know, basically says, you know what, we're not going to have taxis anymore. We're just going to have a mobile app, and anybody can be a taxi driver, and you're just going to hail a cab through your phone. Or uh, somebody like Brian Chesky says, you know what, we're not going to have hotels anymore. We're just going to you know, have an app and monetize an underutilized asset, which is your spare bedroom, and everyone's going to be a hotel keeper. Right? And so Silicon Valley is the, the zoo where the chaos monkeys are kept. And uh, there's a lot of bananas in the zoo, right? Because we're, it's over, there's a lot of money chasing not very many ideas. And so that's Silicon, that's Silicon Valley, and that's what my book is about. Um, and just to give you a summary of what this book is about I'll, and, and about me, I'll get into um, where I came from. So I was raised in this city, which is uh, Miami, which wasn't this little glittering gem when I was a kid. In fact, it was a total backwater in the 80s. Um, but uh, that's where I was raised. And I was raised by parents who fled this guy, who you probably recognize. <laughs> Uh, Fidel Castro and Cuba, my parents were Cuban exiles. They came as children uh, alone, fleeing the revolution. Um, and I'm the grandson of people who fled this guy, who you probably don't recognize. Um, that's uh, Francisco Franco, who was the fascist dictator of Spain. And my grandparents fled, um, fled Franco for, for Cuba. I've always made the joke that my grandparents uh, fled Spain to flee fascism. My parents fled Cuba to flee communism. And now I want to flee capitalism and leave the United States. But that's the, <laughs> the weird triangle trade of my life, or I guess the, the Garcia family. Um, but after all this stuff, I ended up here at Cal, which is Berkeley, basically. And this is going to test my, my local knowledge. But I've been told by my Aussie friends that Cal is the equivalent, basically, of the University of New South Wales to Stanford's University of Sydney, right, where the posh kids go, right? So that's what, that's what Cal basically is. And uh, it was a great school. Um, I had a, a great time there. I'm going to take off this jumper because I'm, I'm between the nervousness and the fact that I had to run here, I'm basically dying. But um, I had a great time there. But then I, I committed the one mistake that set me down the path of horrible, decadent American capitalism, which is I read this book. Who recognizes this book, by the way? <laughs> yes? Um, for those who don't know it, Michael, this is Michael Lewis's first book, the same guy who wrote Liar's Poker, uh, sorry, obviously Liar's Poker, um, Moneyball, uh, The Big Short, Flash Boys, etc. And um, the, um, similar to my book, and by the way, I have license to compare Michael to Liar's Poker because reviewers have actually also compared it. And um, the key thing there is that he was also uh, a trader on Wall Street like, like I was. And um, he, uh, he wrote this book as a cautionary tale, but it ended up being basically a siren song for everyone in finance, which is what I think my book has become, basically. Because um, I'm sure lots of engineers have showed up at Facebook basically with my book under their arm. Um, but after reading this book, I basically bailed on my PhD and went to this place, which is Goldman Sachs uh, trading floor. At the time, that's one New York Plaza. That's, uh, um, that's the CEO there on the right smiling at you, the guy who blew up the Greek economy, among others. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, and I was there for three years, where I played a small role in uh, helping blow up the economy. I was a quant on the credit, credit derivatives trading desk. And so I priced uh, credit derivatives on the investment grade uh, single name CDS desk for uh, Goldman. Um, after watching the world blow up, I realized that tech would be the only place where I'd have a place to, to sort of hide out in. And so I, founded, I went to a, a horrible tech company that raised $140 million and, and produced no products whatsoever. <laughs> but um, I managed to recruit the two best engineers to found this company that you've never heard of. 
but I sold it to this company. Oh, well, this is me at uh, Y Combinator's demo day, by the way, um, pitching with our brand new, spanking new corporate themed uh, uh, t shirts. And um, after 10 months, we had a bunch of users, uh, no revenue, but we still managed to sell it for what was on paper $10 million to um, this company, which you've probably heard of, although probably not for very much longer. And um, <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, and then this company, which you've definitely heard about and probably will for, for years and decades to come, for better or worse. Um, and uh, as I described in the book, actually, I, I sold part of the company to Twitter, but then I actually bailed and went myself to Facebook. And uh, what, did I, what did I do there? This is me in early 2011. Believe it or not, believe it or not, this is one third of Facebook's entire ads team in early 2011. This is the back end uh, core infrastructure team. As you can see, it's a veritable den of white privilege here. Um, and uh, you know, Silicon Valley, at least in the United States, is a sensitive topic about whether it's diverse enough or not. Um, officially, I'm the diversity person here, although really I'm the least diverse person in this group. Um, I'm also the only American citizen, as far as I know, and the uh, only person who spoke English as a first language, which was interesting. Um, but um, yeah, this, this, was the, uh, this was Facebook ads, believe it or not. And this is about a third of the team that was responsible for not quite $2 billion of revenue uh, pre-IPO in 2011. Um, so what did I do there? What did I do there? Um, so I did this shit, basically. So um, you know how you go and you browse the internet, and then you go to Facebook and you see stuff you were looking at in the entire internet in Facebook? So I built that, believe it or not. So all the shit that's tracking you on Facebook, I built the initial versions of that on Facebook. Um, and the story of how I did that is part of the, a big part of the second half of, of, uh, of Chaos Monkey. Um, but in addition, in addition, I knocked up this one who I barely knew twice uh, and had kids with her. Uh, this is British Trader. If you've read the book, this is the famous British Trader who's in the book. I use pseudonyms for the women. But everything else is real names. Um, and those are my, my two kids who are now five and seven. I have another kid actually since the book with another woman I barely know, but that's a, that's a different story. Um, <laughs> I raced around in this borrowed Tesla Roadster and almost crashed it like an idiot. Um, I lived on a sailboat, Ayala, which I still live on a sailboat actually in, in San Francisco Bay. Uh, believe it or not, I used to bicycle to, to, to Facebook. This is about six miles north of Facebook. I used to bicycle to that bicycle you see right there on deck. Um, and, and the, oh, the other thing is I'm a total beer nerd. And so this is, and, and I flooded this guy's desk, who you might recognize. Uh, so that's me actually brewing the night of the IPO. And if you've ever brewed beer, you have to heat it up and then you have to cool it. And in, in the cooling part, I actually managed to blow up the plumbing at Facebook. And um, it was the kitchen right above uh, Zuck's desk. And I flooded it. It's an anecdote in the, boat, in the book. And I didn't realize it until security burst in and said, what the hell are you doing? You just flooded Zuck's desk. Anyhow, I didn't get in trouble, nothing happened. This is what Facebook was like at the time. Uh, and then what else did I do? Oh, and then I'm also a prepper. So if you don't know what that means, it's the sort of people who think the, world, the end of the world is coming. And so this is my land in the equivalent of, I guess, your Tasmania in these islands up in the northwest, north of, of Seattle. And this is a piece that came out in the New Yorker about techies who are preppers. It's actually a whole thing among Sam Silicon Valley tribe. And this is a teepee that I live in, believe it or not, up in, the, uh, up in the island. Anyhow, so this is the background as sort of a prep for Chaos Monkeys, but I'm not here to really talk about that. Um, Although I'm sure you're asking, why did I write Chaos Monkeys, right? Because it burns all your bridges, right? Um, which it kind of didn't actually in the end. And, I, and I'm sure I'm going to get a question of like, what did Silicon Valley say to my book? And I, I'm happy to answer that later. But why did I write Chaos Monkeys, right? Two reasons. One, this thing, right? This thing in our, in our pockets, right? I'm old enough to remember not just pre-smartphone, pre-internet, right? I'm old, right? And my mother's a librarian. I remember you used to have to go to a card catalog to look something up, right? Or talk to somebody who knew something about something. And if you couldn't find either the book or the person, you just didn't know about that thing, right? That's just how it worked, right? And the fact that now all human knowledge is in our pockets, right, I think is like on the order of the printing press in terms of like human historical events, right? And I wanted to catalog that process. What's the other reason though, right? That's a very highfalutin, grandiose reason. What's the other reason? Well, the other reason is this fucking bullshit, right? <laughs> right? What's the version that, or what's the vision that probably many of you, and I don't blame you for it, I had that vision too, uh, have of Silicon Valley? It's this, right? It's the brilliant, steely-eyed you know, entrepreneur with some brilliant vision who engages in flawless technical implementation, right? And then has instant product market fit and makes a billion dollars and ends up on the cover of Forbes, right? And that's not how Silicon Valley works at fucking all, right? Because I've been inside these companies, I've seen how it works, and that's not how it is, right? So let's just take a few examples here just to illustrate. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's all luck, by the way, okay, just to be clear. But I'm just saying it's not quite what this vision is. So let's take one example. Has anyone here heard the story of how Facebook video happened? Anyone know? 
It's actually not known. It's not in the book, and it's not known generally outside of the company. Um, I wasn't there for this, but I, I, I heard the story, you know, firsthand for those who were there, and it became part of Facebook lore. It's recounted in the onboarding. I mean, this is real Facebook history. So how did it happen? Facebook used to have what are called hackathons, which I expect people here actually know, know what those are, right? And so um, literally in one hackathon, uh, two or three guys got together and said, you know, we just shipped Facebook photos and tagging, right? Why don't we actually also ship uh, video, right? Which again, now it seems like the most obvious thing in the world, but at the time it was actually pretty unusual, right? That, that you would upload a video on Facebook. They, they shipped a very basic version. They, they demoed it to Zuck. He completely hated it and thought it was the stupidest thing in the world and said, stop what you're doing and get back to work. They ignored him and they locked themselves in a conference room and they, they, they made it you know, productizable and they shipped it in the next release. And it, Facebook is now the second biggest video sharing site after YouTube. Right? But this is something that Zuck was totally against and in fact said, don't fucking work on it, it's stupid. Right? But that's just one example of one thing. Let me cite another example. Um, oh, sorry, well, one, one, one step before that. Why, why does Facebook win? Again, I'm not saying that you know, it's all luck, okay? But there's a couple things. A uh, culture of engineering excellence. So, okay, somebody guess, how often does Facebook ship a, a completely new production vo version of the site? Like the entire fucking thing. And just to put it in context, just realize Facebook is one quarter of the internet everywhere except China, okay? So how often does Facebook actually ship a new version of itself? Anyone want to guess? Someone guess. Six weeks. Every six weeks. Okay, six weeks. Anybody else want to bet? Six hours. Every fortnight. Every fortnight. Okay, two weeks, six weeks, and several times a day. Several times a day to different, like, different versions to different locations. Right, yeah, so it actually it ships codes three times a day, actually, yeah. And when I was there, it was once, and they, they amped up to two because London kicked in the gear, and then because of the time zones, they now do it three times a day. And uh, for those who are non-technical, that's like swapping out the engine on a 747 while it's in flight, just, just because you can. So that's what Facebook does. Uh, so the engineering at Facebook, for all that I'm about to say and dump on it, just be aware that it's actually super, super really good actually, and super ambitious. The second one is the will to ship, right? Uh, Facebook used to have a poster that said, move fast and break things, right? So no matter what, Facebook will always ship. Even if it's a piece of shit, even if it's half-baked, it doesn't matter, ship, 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 right? Third thing, agility in responding to errors and the unexpected, right? Facebook doesn't have much of a plan <laughs> in general, but it responds very quickly to reality. And I'll, we'll get into how uh, in a second. Okay, here's the other one. Uh, anyone actually recognize who this guy is? Airbnb, founder of Airbnb, Brian Chesky. I met him on the uh, first day of, Airbnb, of uh, Y Combinator, uh, which is the accelerator that I went through. They funded Airbnb as well. And he told us this story. Uh, how did Airbnb get funded early on? Does anyone know? It couldn't raise money. Serial, exactly. <laughs> so in 2008, these are a bunch of designers who their thought was, uh, why don't we actually book spots on people's air mattresses and that'll be Airbnb, right? That's the whole, that's the air. Uh, but they couldn't raise money, so they went to the political conventions, bought cheap cereal, designed these, these covers for them, and then sold them for 40 bucks a pop, and that's how they made rent uh, in the first few years, right? Because they had the classic problem of an entrepreneur, they're creating a two-sided market with no supply, there's no demand, with no demand, there's no supply, they couldn't get it going, they, they languished there for years. So this is how Airbnb funded itself before they figured it out. Uh, next example. Um, People here know what Docker is? Yeah, right. So if you don't know it, it's a way, I've never even used it because I, I stopped pushing code before it came out, but um, it's a way of deploying basically apps to remote servers. Um, I actually was in YC with this guy over here, Solomon. Uh, it, it used to be known as Doc Cloud. It was in my YC batch, along with the Aussies that made this possible, by the way, a company called Wearscope. But um, um, th they had some completely other idea Right? It was some sort of back-end server admin. It was some piece of shit idea, basically. Right? And then somewhere early on, some early employee open sourced some random project they had. They gave it a random name that they didn't even decide on. Uh, I have it on good authority that Solomon doesn't even like the name of the company. But the engineer gave it the name Docker because he liked these, this ship container idea. And now it became you know, this billion dollar company. It's a unicorn company. It's worth, you know, I think they just, they just raised, yeah, they, they raised um, on a north of a billion dollar um, valuation recently. Right? But again, it was... Uh, it was kind of an accidental discovery that they pivoted the entire company to exploit, right? Um, one last thing about Facebook, right? All this dumping on Facebook, how, you know, Facebook's uh, market valuation's gone up 5X since I left, 5X, okay? How did that happen? Anyone know? How, did how does Facebook make most of its money now? Ads. Well, no, obvi well obviously, fuck, obviously ads, but like what, what sort of ads? <laughs> Mobile newsfeed ads, believe it or not. 
which now seems obvious, but I can assure you, because I was in these initial discussions and I described them in, in the book, nobody thought that mobile newsfeed would be the fucking future of Facebook, right? Not at all. In fact, um, they had tried shipping some version of mobile newsfeed ads for years with no success. But what happened? In mid-2013, a, Facebook became majority mobile. Again, it's odd to imagine now, but at one point in time, Facebook was mostly desktop, it wasn't mobile. Um, secondly, this entire th business of the entire mobile app install you know, budget of like people calculating LTVs and CACs and, CP you know, and CPA bidding on mobile ad networks, all that shit didn't exist until about 2013, right? In which companies like King.com would pay you know, tens of millions, $100 million budgets to get you to install their most recent game, right? That all converged in 2013. And if you learn one thing, there's, if you take one thing away from this talk that you're gonna mostly forget probably, remember this, right? This is how Silicon Valley really works, right? You ship 10 things, seven absolutely fail, right? Two kind of do okay for reasons that you kind of thought they would. And then one thing does absolutely out the fucking park, home run, for reasons that only make sense later, right? But you write the narrative fallacy around it as if that's what you were intending the entire time. And companies do this all the time. But I can assure you that was not the case at all. This was called Neko. It was, a, it was a little piddly project. It was one of 12 things going on, and it took over the world. And it's why Facebook stock uh, quintupled in the past three years. Um, so what's the problem with that? Um, so, you know, selling ads is kind of like selling real estate at some point, right? You have a massive eyeballs that you're selling. You have inventory that you're selling, right? And you sell, 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 right? But at some point you run out of real estate to sell, right? And how has Facebook been meeting or, or just slightly exceeding every quarter's numbers for the past three years? How do they do it? Anyone here working at tech? So they have a knob, basically, and they, they basically turn and increase what's called the impression, uh, the impression frequency cap. In other words, the number of ads you see per person, per user, per day, they just subtly nudge up, and they've been doing that for three or four years. And everybody knows this who's been in the Facebook ecosystem, right? And that's how, they, that's how, they meet, that's how they've met their numbers, right? But at some point, you know, the jig is up, right? And it's kind of like, I say, the metaphor I use in the book is that it's like, the, you know, the Western explorers who settled North America, and they get to the Pacific, and it's over, right? And, and just to you know, engage in my usual American style, you know, you know, personal like self-marketing, right? This, I wrote this in January of 2016, and the book came out in June of 2016, in which I warned that pimping out newsfeed had to end at some point, and then what would Facebook do, right? That at some point this has come to an end. And of course, literally two quarters later, uh, <laughs> Zuck in an earnings call, Q3 of 2016, for the first time ever, right? He warned, uh, the ad load uh, is a bit of an issue. Don't expect numbers to go up in the future like they have in the past, which completely spooked investors. Of course, they'd never heard that coming from Facebook before. But of course, anyone who was inside Facebook would have known this, right? This was building for two or three years, but that's, that's the reality of it, right? And so the, you know, the question you might be asking is, well, what's Facebook gonna do next, right? And, and it's a good question. Um, is Facebook innovating the way that it used to? I'm gonna claim that it kind of isn't, actually. Why is that? Well, one thing, the will to ship, I think, and it's not just my opinion, by the way, um, the opinion of lots of people that I used to work with at Facebook uh, seem to think that Facebook is getting to a point where it doesn't ship like it used to. Why is that? Or, will, or, or like, what arguments do I have to, to prove that point? Well, um, one thing is, uh, there used to be a thing at Facebook called Creative Lab. So basically the best designers, best, best product managers would sit in a room and try to create the future. And so they shipped apps that you've probably, maybe at one point heard of, but probably have forgotten, called Paper, uh, called, what the fuck was it called? Something like Boomerang or something stupid. Oh, Slingshot, which was a total Snapchat, uh, Snapchat clone, et cetera, et cetera, right? I, I, I guess I thought Boomerang because of Australia. But, um, and they basically gave up. They shut it down, actually, at the beginning of 2016. So they're no longer trying to create the future. They've given up. So what do they do? Well, they buy the future instead. So they bought Instagram for a billion dollars in 2012, which is a good acquisition, by the way, to be clear. It's obviously a good acquisition. But, and then they bought WhatsApp for 19 billion in 2014, right? Because obviously they, they didn't, cr they're not creating the app experiences that people are actually using. The way that we interact with this device, with the internet spliced into our lives, they're not creating that anymore, right? So what happens if you actually can't buy the future? What do you do as a company? Anyone know? Well, you steal it, of course. Right? And so on the left, you have Twitter's trending topics. Right? And on the right, you have Facebook's trending topics. Right? Amazing resemblance, really. Right? So what's the one thing that Twitter has that Facebook doesn't? Right? At least in the United States. I don't know about here. But in the United States, at least, it is still the public forum. It is the place where people go and vent and Trump tweets some goddamn thing and it destabilizes an entire region. Like, that sort of shit still happens on Twitter and it doesn't happen on Facebook. Right? And so Facebook is trying to capture that from Twitter. What else does Facebook not have? Oh, look at that. 
in case you can't tell the difference, by the way, <laughs> on the left is Snapchat, and the right two panes are actually Facebook, right? And so the middle one is Messenger, which I don't know if you're big users of it. Messenger used to be a really nice, minimalist, simple messaging app, and now it's like this bucket of shit in which like literally every product feature of every little PM in Facebook gets some idea, it's dumped into Messenger. Among them is what are called stories, which is what you see on top. And so, um, you know, Snapchat, if you use Snapchat, is kind of pivoted around either the channel of the voice that you're sort of, you know, that you're sort of lurking on, right? While Facebook, it's an ordered, uh, you know, series of elements in your feed. It's a very different sort of paradigm. But they basically spliced in the story concept into feed in this really super awkward and ugly way. And by the way, in all the secret, like, ex-Facebook alum groups, everyone sits here and bitches and moans about how they're copying Snapchat in the most egregious way possible. But, um, so this is the reality of, of Oh, wait, so before I go to that slide. Oh, wait, I can't go back. Oh, shit. Sorry, can someone restart the presentation, please? And just go to, like, the penultimate slide. More. Or I, you know, I can just do it if you want, because I know it better. <laughs> All right, sorry. Um, so um, what's, what's the lesson to learn here? Um, I'll tell you another anecdote. Um, wait, so how many people here actually read Li Liar's Poker? I didn't, I didn't actually do an appropriate poll earlier. Raise your hands again. Sorry, Liar's Poker people. Not, not that many, okay. So it was Liar's Poker Parallel that I was gonna cite, but I won't cite it if you haven't actually read the book. But um, we had a scene very similar to Liar's Poker at Facebook. In early 2013, uh, we rolled onto Facebook at 10.30, because that's about when you roll onto Facebook. Nothing happens before 10. And um, we saw a little red book on our desks. And it's probably, most of you are probably too young to remember communism in the Cold War, right? But Mao had his little red book, right? Which was the guide to like the communist revolution. So Facebook, believe it or not, actually has a little red book. You can actually Google it. Some parts of it are actually public. You can Google Facebook little red book and you'll see shots of this book. And we saw this little red book on our desk. And it was this very sort of raw, raw corporate exercise in Facebook's values and our future and what it all means. They had photos from like the sort of motivational calendar type shit. It was ridiculous, basically. But at the end, they had like this sort of like grim reminder of death. And this was the last page. The, the quality is total shit because it's like me with my phone over the book that I still, that I of course still have. Um, and this was the last page of the little red book. And uh, if you can't read in the back, um, if we don't create the thing that kills Facebook, someone else will. Right? The internet is not a friendly place. Things that don't stay relevant don't even get the luxury of leaving ruins. They disappear. And I'm sure this is pure Zuck because this sounds like one of his speeches. This is exactly what Zuck would say. Um, and so that's the reality. So again, just to be clear, I'm not saying short Facebook. I think Facebook will be around for years. They're very good at what they do. The growth team's amazing, et cetera, et cetera. But I do find it interesting, and I'm not the only one who thinks so, that uh, you know, Facebook, in some sense, isn't creating the thing that will kill Facebook. Somebody kind of else is. And uh, the big lesson here, the thing that Zuck fears, I'm almost certain, um, is, um, you know, it, is not the sort of typical greedy little startup founder, because that guy can always be bought. Um, what Zuck fears, okay, in this world, when he looks over at companies like Google and Larry Page, or Amazon and Bezos, and formerly Jobs and Apple, right, he sees an image of himself, right, and that's terrifying, right? That's the guy with a monomaniacal vision and the resources and inclination to actually realize in the real world, right? And someday, someday, he's going to run up against the guy who's created the thing that's going to kill Facebook, and that guy won't sell or won't be co-opted or won't be intimidated, right? And that's when, that's when people are going to start losing sleep at Facebook, right? And I, I don't think it's happened yet. I'm not, I don't think Snapchat is it, but at some point it, it will happen, right? And this, this prophecy will be proven true um, at some point in the future. So anyway, I ran through this really fast, I, hopefully not too fast. Um, I did actually have some other slides I could go through, but I, I guess I didn't even include them in, this, in the presentation, so I won't. So maybe we can just leave it open for a, a long Q&A session. It tends to run over, and so uh, I guess we can just have lots of questions. Um, Cheryl, nod yes or no, if that's okay. Yeah? Okay. Yes. So just a reminder, this is a catch box. It may or may not be thrown at you in such. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so over the years, Facebook has been a phenomenal distribution fire hose for companies to kind of grow. So originally, yeah. organically with companies like Zynga, yeah. and then over time with Paid, and you talked about King Digital and so <laughs> forth. Do you think there's any opportunity today for companies to grow inside Facebook, given the fact they've ramped down organic so much and they've upped the ad load so much? And yeah. if so, where might those opportunities be, do you think? Yeah, you know, I, as a, yeah. <laughs> Another thing with Facebook, Facebook doesn't actually see partner other companies as partners, they see them as temporarily convenient, um, you know, means to other ends, right? I would never build or work for a company that in some sense depended on Facebook to survive because it's, it's, you're going to get crushed at some point because Facebook doesn't care. 
And so I think temporarily, maybe you, you'll find that indeed, yeah, you, I mean, remember that company Social Cam that was this like annoyingly viral company that would put these viral videos? And they just changed the feed algo and they got crushed, right? And so I think it's, I think it's really risky to build a company on, on top of Facebook because they, they just don't care. Um, but, but as a channel, do you think there's any opportunities with some of the new things they're doing? Or do you I mean, didn't Guardian just bail on instant articles, right? Like, uh, I mean, there's a whole tension there between, um, I, I don't know if you're familiar, but like you talk to any journalist and, and north of 50% of their traffic comes from Facebook, right? And so, um, I mean, this is a bigger topic we can get into if you want, but like the, um, you know, newspapers used to have like a front page editor, the guy who decided what's on the front page of the newspaper, and, f and Zuck is now the front page editor for every newspaper in the world, right? Just to cite one example to your question, right? And I think a lot of those companies are really uneasy about casting their entire fates in with, with Zuck, right? Um, and so that's why I think some would abandon instant articles. If you don't know what instant articles is, that's when you host like publisher content on Facebook itself. Like you click, and it's a really good experience. So of course it loads from Facebook, but it's, it's, it's basically Facebook hosting your entire site, right? It's like you're all Facebook. And, uh, and they even monetize it. There's ads running inside instant articles that actually monetizes the other person, third party content, right? And so I think a lot of companies are really unsure about that. And, and I think rightly so, they should be, so. Yeah. Like just, just following on from that, do yeah. you think that in Facebook there is a sense of responsibility about, uh, about all this? You know, there's all this talk about filter bubbles and yeah. uh, Trump and Brexit. Yeah, know. yeah. Uh, is there any kind of responsibility? Are they likely to kind of change yeah. the way they do things? You know, I, I think it's a really good question. I think that's one of the big unknowns with Facebook. Um, historically, the answer is no. They haven't felt responsibility. One, because they just don't want it. And two, I think it's so... Their DNA is so much that of a tech company and not a media company, and those are very different sorts of companies if you've worked inside them. And so the notion of actually having to filter or curate content to them is just not something that they're very comfortable with. But um, after, you know, the election obviously was a big deal, right, in the US, like a big fucking deal, right? And on uh, November 9th, and I think as, as long as the 10th, Zuck gave some ridiculous statement in which he said, oh, there's no way that fake news could have thrown the election or Facebook could have influenced the election, which of course is like a ridiculous statement on the face of it. I mean, I was there in 2012 for the, the the prior election, there's an entire political ad sales team that does nothing that, but talk to politicians and try to convince them that Facebook can, can give them the election, right? For Zuck to get up and say, oh, there's no way Facebook, you know, spun the election, that, that, that's just ridiculous in the face of it. Of course, four days later, he came to a census, or the PR team did, and um, for the first time ever, he, he said, you know what, we're gonna take steps to actually crush fake news, and since then, he actually has ship features. Like if you go and you click, at least in the US, I know about Australia, but if you click on the, on the little arrow on the upper right hand column, you can actually report fake news now, which you couldn't before. And so Facebook is actually, I think, the blow up uh, in Silicon Valley and also inside Facebook, by the way. I heard from my spies inside Facebook that in fact there's massive threads, there's an entire dissident faction inside Facebook that thinks that Facebook should have squelched Trump, basically, um, rather than let him go whole hog on Facebook, right? And so I think he's getting a lot of pressure internally and externally to actually do that. And so I think for the first time ever, you're seeing Zuck kind of bend over and basically say, okay, okay, we'll take more responsibility for it. Because I think basically people are just not gonna let him get away with it anymore. Um, and he announced that he's gonna hire 5,000 more ops people to actually filter ads, which is, may not sound like a lot, but I was employed 2,000 when I joined Facebook, and when I left, I think it was 5,000. I think right now it's maybe 10 to 15,000, so 5,000 people is a lot of people at Facebook. And so that's a big commitment from Zuck uh, on the fake news, which I think he's totally changed his tune uh, in terms of that, and I think, yeah, he's gonna take a lot more responsibility going forward, yeah. Yep. Um, Thank, thank, yeah, <laughs> thank, sure. thanks so much for your talk. Um, yeah. uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, Twitter, you, you never commented about Twitter. I'd be interested in um, some thoughts yeah. about that. Um, also, um, you, you commented that um, the reception to your book has actually resulted uh, in not burning bridges. I'd yeah. also be interested to, to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the Twitter thing, I shouldn't have dumped on it too much. Actually, I liked them, and, and, and believe it or not, I actually I became an advisor. So, the way the deal worked, by the way, and just in case any of you are in startups, or how many, out of curiosity, how many of you are actually in startups? Oh wow, fuck a lot, okay. So uh, does everyone know what an aqua hire is, right? Yeah, so aqua hire means, in, in the US, there's such a dearth of engineering talent that the corp dev department, the, the, the department that buys other companies is basically a recruiting organization. And they buy companies just to buy engineers. And unlike, say, eggs or milk, when you buy in volume, you actually pay more rather than less per engineer because the company, for whatever reason, commands a premium, right? So a lot of people got hired at Facebook, Twitter, whatever, in aqua hires, as did I, right? And so it, it's not like, 
it was 10 million on paper or whatever, you basically just have a super juicy hiring offer and you vest out in the same way any other employee would, right? The company actually is immaterial. It was basically a job interview for that, that job. That this is the reality. Every Aqua hire is a failure, okay? Just, and anyone being honest with themselves understands, like I say, oh, you were acquired by Twitter. That's a sign of failure. The company was gonna, a disaster, right? It was gonna die, but we managed to find a soft landing at Twitter and Facebook, okay? Um, so in that process, it's usually more higher than Acqui in the sense that you interview, everyone gets interviewed, right? It's not like they're buying the company, right? The company is a GitHub repo and you know, a bunch of convertible notes to some investors. That's the company, right? And so they interview everybody, and as often happens, by the way, Again, everything in my book is not very unique. It's actually very emblematic. I'm, I'm a totally typical, non-extraordinary example. Just no one ever talks about it, right? And so what happened? I went to Facebook. They interviewed everybody. And for whatever reason, okay, for whatever reason, they didn't want my co-founders and they wanted me, right? And we went to Twitter and they wanted everybody, right? And Twitter at the time, and even now, was a bit of a, of, of a clown show, right? Like they didn't know how to run the deal. They saw the, the, the fail whale, while Facebook felt like the Roman Empire, right? They had this expansive vision. Uh, there was one scene, which I have in the book, uh, in the middle of the, the day-long grilling interview, right? I go to the bathroom, and there's a guy on the toilet coding on the toilet, believe it or not. And I know he was coding, I listened to him, because he's on the john, he's got his laptop in there. It's not the usual little chatty, oh, hey, how's it going, girlfriend? Oh, it's good, no, 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 no. It was like, you know, Emacs macro, commit, like, it was like the usual cadence that I've lived with for years of engineers actually committing code on the john, right? And then I look over at the sink, and there's like toothbrushes and toothpaste there. And I look in the garbage, and there's a bunch of used toothbrushes. People actually use it. People were living there. Uh, Facebook's campus fucking stunk. It smelled like a frat house, right? And it looked like shit, basically, because everyone was basically living there, building this thing. And you go to Twitter, and it was this beautiful design space with like $3,000 fixies and you know three types of kombucha on tap and all this bullshit, right? <laughs> and it's just like... And like one of the guys even confided to me that like, oh, we serve breakfast and lunch, but we don't serve dinner, wink, wink, because no one sticks around that long. Anyhow, it was just obviously a very different sort of company, right? And so between all these various anecdotes, right, one of the few good calls I made was that, you know, Facebook at the end would end up winning, right? And so that's kind of why. So not that Twitter is terrible, like I still use it a lot, and I still think that f it's still the center of the action in a way that Facebook isn't when it comes to politics in the US, but um, it's clear that Facebook is a better run company, right, like it just is. Um, and in fact, everybody that was involved in the deal, everyone in, Fa in Twitter's ads team that I work with as an advisor, they're all gone. Every single fucking one is gone. Some of them even went to Facebook, which is crazy because it's like the great enemy, but they're all gone. And then the other thing is, the other question you asked was, how do people actually react to the, the book? You know, the reaction has been almost universally the following. Um, whoever, whether it be my co-founders or whether it be people at Facebook that I work with, and again, I use real names and I quote real conversations. Uh, the reaction has usually been, you know, Antonio, you're kind of a caustic asshole a little bit, right? You can probably tell. Um, and you're, you, you know, there's some interpretation that I'd maybe disagree with, but by and large, it was accurate. It, you got it right. That's what it was like, right? And so I think if you turn that same caustic eye on yourself as you do on others, and if at the end of the day you're fundamentally accurate, I think you get a pass for a lot of stuff, actually. And so I think I've never had anybody yell at me saying, Antonio, you're completely fucking full of shit. That's not how it went down. You got it totally wrong. I've never had that experience. And so I think, you know, I, that's, to me, that's like, you know, that's like a, a, a sanity check that I didn't get it totally wrong. That even people in it, some of whom are not portrayed in the most flattering way, to be honest, said like, well, you know, that's kind of what it was, right? So, yeah, that's, that was basically the reaction. So I don't think I'll get a, a job at Facebook again, to be clear. <laughs> but, you know, I probably could be, you know, gainfully employed in tech if I wanted to be, because, you know. The other thing is, which I quote in the book, is success, you know, forgives all sins, right? So the book did really well in the U.S. And so the fact that it did well in the, you know, celebrity mad culture of the U.S. means that, like, well, you know, we can't hate them too much, right? So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So what would kill Facebook and where do you think it's Facebook? Dude, if I knew, I'd fucking invest in it or try to build it. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I, I, I really don't know. Dude, I'm an ads guy. I don't claim to understand consumer tech at all, to be honest. I, I don't really get it at all. I know how to turn a human attention into money and data into money. That's what I know how to do. Beyond that, I don't, I don't know how to c create compelling consumer experiences. I really don't. I so, don't. What, so what's Facebook's Achilles heel then? Well, I mean, the two things I showed, right? Like, it's not, it's not, it's not the public forum of opinion that Twitter is, right? Um, it just isn't. People don't use Facebook that I use Facebook that way, but I'm a total social media gadfly. I don't think most people use Facebook in that very public way that Twitter is good for. And so, you know, that's one opening there. Um, 
Again, it's going to be some kid with some new concept with how we interact with phones, and that kid's going to be a fucking maniac like Zuck is, and he's not going to sell out, and he's going to be really good, and he's going to have this other experience that Facebook's just going to totally miss the boat on. I, I, and again, I don't know what that is, but at some point it's going to happen. Yeah. Thanks very much for, uh, for sure. coming out and talking. Um, just drawing on some of your experience it, as, an, as an ads guy, yeah. um, if you right now had like a really high traffic website and you were to build an ad program, what yeah. would that program look like? Oh man. <laughs> you know, I've actually never worked in the publisher side. I've only worked in the buy side. Um, I mean, mobile publisher, Facebook ha has a product called Audience Network, which works pretty well. If you're not familiar with that, uh, Audience Network is Facebook ads running on, on, other si on sites other than Facebook. And it was probably the only, it's probably the only unique, interesting ad product they've shipped since I've left, to be honest. Um, and it works pretty well. CPMs are really high. Um, I don't know. Um, on, it's funny because another thing I usually go into is Facebook data. What does Facebook know about you? Like, it was my job, believe it or not, to turn your data into money for years. And um, on desktop, a lot of that data actually isn't very good. But on mobile, it actually is very good compared to other mobile data sources. And so Facebook tends to do very well on mobile for various reasons. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's another reason why Facebook killed it on mobile, right? They have no fraud, right? Because they know who the real person is, right? There's so much fraud in ads, it's, it's out of control. And then B, they know your real age, your real gender, your real location, all that stuff. And on mobile, that quality, that ads quality, that data quality, sorry, is usually pretty poor. And so, yeah, I mean, I, audience network would be one option, for example. What else? Um, you mentioned at the start that Facebook doesn't really have big penetration in China. Yeah. So do you think that WeChat would be a big contender to Facebook? Or coming uh, up? Well, I mean, the thing in China is by design. The government doesn't blocks China. Uh, sorry, blocks uh, Facebook, right? Um, you know, everyone says that all these Chinese apps are going to like somehow take over the world, but I've yet to see a single Chinese consumer app be used by anyone who's not Chinese, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry, it's, it might be kind of a charged statement, but like, I'll believe it when I see somebody using it in the United States in English, right? Which I've never seen in my entire life. So, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Antonio, great yeah. talk. Yeah. Just. Um, a bit of a left field question. Obviously, sure. with Chaos Monkeys, um, you've been a um, what uh, I wouldn't say a critic of um, Silicon Valley, but more like it's uh, more like an act of conscience right. of Silicon Valley. You know, it's interesting. I, w I attended a um, talk um, given by someone who was a, a, a startup convener in Israel, and he said one of the reasons the Israelis produce really, really good technology, not just in terms of Facebook, is because they have to do it. And Elon Musk, in his biography, was quoted as saying, hang on, you know, in the 60s, we had all these guys figuring out how to get us to the moon. Now we've got the best and the brightest figuring out what's the most expedient way in 140 characters we can say we've taken a shit. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. What's your take on, uh, in terms of, you know, like the focus of Silicon Valley and in terms of where the future, uh, in terms of um, where, where you would like to see its future going? Yeah, no, I, I think one big criticism I think you can make validly of Silicon Valley, and again, I think it's one shared by lots of Silicon Valley people, is, um, you know, Silicon Valley invests in a bunch of stupid bullshit, right? Um, like, just to cite an example, in 2014, the Indian government spent about $70 million and they sent a probe to Mars, right? It was, a big, it was a big success for the Indian space program, right? And obviously a huge coup just in general, right? It's like, that's really cheap by space program standards, right? $70 million is what was invest, invested in PATH, which, does anyone know what the fuck PATH was? No, okay, obviously not, right? And so Path was, you know, actually kind of a high quality app experience, and it was by Dave Morin, who's kind of a big shot, former Facebook or whatever. It was a failure of a startup. Uh, that's what also was invested in Slide, which is Mac Leftin's most recent startup. Anyhow, a bunch of startups have raised that much capital and have produced nothing, right? And so you know, it's slightly heretical, but I wonder if the short term, you know, profit maximizing asset allocation strategy of VC is actually the best, right? And if you actually confiscated all of St. Home, you know, Rhodes money and like guillotined the VCs and just appointed like a hand-picked select group of scientists from the DOD and NASA to actually invest in shit, you know, I wonder if we'd actually get the toys we actually fucking want and not the 140 characters of Twitter, to be honest, right? Like I'm just not convinced that the market mechanism in this particular case actually invests in long-term value, right? Like, all this shit, all this internet shit was like a ridiculous Defense Department project in the 70s, right? I don't know if you, I mean, you probably know about the history of the internet, right? DARPA and all this, right? It was literally government bureaucrats saying, oh, let's create this computer network, even though you would never have gotten a, a VC to invest in any of that shit in the day, right? So yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, Silicon Valley, I think, is deeply wrong in terms of a lot of what it invests in. And I think a lot of people would say that. Like, it's not just me. I think a lot of people would actually agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Hey Antonio, thank you. Th thank you for your talk today. Um, yeah. I have a question. So with you've mentioned that um, a lot of these Silicon Valley companies are like um, chaos monkeys, and they're and but. Obviously, for these monkeys to function, there's obviously people throwing the bananas, the, right. the yeah. VCs, and the always the people basically um, constantly throwing money so that these people can constantly try and you know basically break the world or improve the world in different ways. Right. Um, do you think there's up to a point where because um, a lot of reports show that VC returns aren't actually better than significant returns? That one day the VC says, "Yeah, you know what? We've thrown enough money, and it's not as return as other fields. We're going to stop." And then the Silicon Valley sees kind of a bit of a sort of flat flattening or even somewhat decline where people just stop throwing money at it dude I, you know i wish i was wealthy enough to think about vc returns i really don't, I, I, really, I mean I, i'm sure i'm sure on a risk adjusted basis if you actually looked at a portfolio of uh, different vc funds i'm sure that it actually yeah it doesn't return better than the s p i'm sure it doesn't i mean funds there's massive confirmation bias right i mean all these a lot of uh, vcs can't raise funds anymore right and then you tend to have the same people raising funds so anyhow, I, my point is that, yeah i don't I find it easy to believe that that the average Silicon Valley VC does not return above average returns. Yeah, I have no trouble believing that. Yeah, I mean the reality is that I don't even think that this, that the decision making is what matters. The key part to being a VC is deal flow. It's getting access to the good deals, right? Like the few VCs or angels that I know that have actually done well, it's because they get first look at those great deals, whether it be a YC company or not, right? That as the, the couple of VCs that I know, they spend their entire lives trying to keep themselves in the flow of information and the deal flow so they, so they can at least get to say yes to the next Airbnb. Like, that's their challenge. And given, uh, you know, a flow of high-quality deal flow, I think you could basically throw a dart at any of them. And assuming you have high-quality deal flow, you'll do okay because some of those companies will do very, very well. But that's the key thing. I'm not even sure the decision-making is that important. But, again, I've, I've never been a VC. I mean, who am I to actually question their decision-making? But, um, again, I think a lot of people would probably say the same thing. So. Who's got the box? Oh, there we go. Who's got the box? I was going to check the price of your book. And uh, it seems like on Amazon it costs $17. Uh-oh. On IndieBound it costs $30. Uh-oh. Do you earn much? Uh, so the, the book market is fascinating. You know, I, I, I was actually, speaking of tell-all, I was actually going to write a huge Medium post on how do you sell a book, because everyone asked me. So by the way, if anyone's thinking of writing a book, don't do it, because um, you're, you're going you're gonna to waste, uh, well, not waste, but you're gonna, it's going to eat up two years of your life. And then when you publish the book, every friend that's thinking about writing a book will hit you up for advice on how to sell the book, because it's like the fantasy everyone has of selling a book, right? And I've had to turn down all these coffees of like, hey, how did you sell your book? Um, but I wanted to write a Medium post that actually told the story of, and I'm not going to give you a summary version now because I'll bore you, but um, here's one weird reality of the book market that you probably didn't know. I actually make no money from every copy you buy, so I have no incentive to actually get you buy a book, and that's actually a good thing. <laughs> Anyone know why? That means the publisher overpaid, right? Because my advance was so big that I would have to sell so much to actually even blow through that such that I even get a royalty check, right? And so many agents will actually literally boast that none of my writers ever see a royalty check. And that sounds terrible, but in fact, if you're in the industry, you know what that means is they bent the publishers over a barrel so much and the advance was so juicy that they never saw a royalty check. Unless, of course, it becomes, you know, you know 50 shades of gray or whatever, right? If you get to that point, then, <laughs> then that's a whole different scale of the world, right? But most books do well, but don't become Harry Potter, right? That's the reality, right? And so the reality is they overpay so much, but you actually never see a royalty check. So actually, I don't get paid anything from any copy you buy, and I have no control of prices. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I should have a real question behind yeah. this. Okay, sorry. Go, okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Shit, sorry. I went off on a whole tangent. No. Um, um, getting a startup um, started is really hard. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you got a full time job. What, what you know? What Quit would, the full time advice, job. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to, to, to do it? I think doing a startup half assed is very difficult. Uh, it's basically impossible. I can't think of many successful startup entrepreneurs who started it as a part time project in a significant way. You have to quit and do it full time, otherwise it's just not possible. It's like having two families, like you just can't. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, great talk. Uh, so as someone w who works in ad tech for Facebook, I think you know, most of us who use Facebook would assume that they use a lot of our information. Yes, Where they don't, are. they don't. They don't? No, What's up? sorry, don't let me interrupt. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, look, um, I was, Basically, going to ask, uh, you know, what are, are there any sort of uh, bits of information that Facebook gets about us, or that we wouldn't expect that they use to yes. generate the ads? There was a bit of a discussion a couple of years ago as to whether or not they were trying to interpret audio. 
Um, oh God, yeah, yeah. I know it was a bit of a conspiracy theory, but yes. I mean, without focusing on that, is there anything that Facebook used that might surprise us to learn in yeah. terms of serving ads? That's a good question. So there's, there's a whole chapter in the book on how they use your data to, to make money, right? And so here's the, here's the easy way to say it. Um, most of your data on Facebook is not actually commercially interesting, right? Um, and, and the easiest way to phrase it is like, just because, for example, just take for example, just, just because there's a photo of you naked on the internet doesn't mean that anyone would actually pay money to see it, right? That's the reality of it, right? And so just are. because Facebook <laughs> has so much of your private data doesn't mean that anyone would actually pay to use it in any real way. And I, I know it's rough to say and it's very unflattering and whatever, but one of the big fallacies people have when they think about Facebook is like, the thing that I most want the world not to know is what Facebook most wants. And that's not true at all, right? Because like, what would they even do with a nude photo of you? Like it has no value whatsoever, right? Or the, your conversation with your girlfriend or boyfriend or photos when you were drunk at your bachelor party or any of that shit, right? It doesn't mean anything. There's no use for it, right? Um, and so by and large, and, it, and I, I mentioned the book, I spent a year, I was the first targeting product manager at Facebook. My job literally was turn our data into money everywhere you can. And there's a, product there's a, a project called Project Judy, so obviously I gave it the name, obviously as a Spanish citizen there. And, um, and we literally sucked in every piece of user data that we had at the time, this 2011, okay, there's more user data now then. But we fed it into the targeting system and very little of it actually changed the click-through rate, which is the metric that we had, right? Because again, the reality is that a lot of that is invaluable. But here's the one thing that is valuable that you don't know you're probably giving Facebook. <laughs> Facebook knows who you are in every device that you touch. Right? Because this app is so sticky, the time between you buy a new screen and you log into Facebook is measured in seconds, right? Because you log into Facebook immediately, any, any device you get, right? And that's very valuable. And in case it's not clear why that's valuable, think about, think about how you actually consume media, right? You're at work, uh, you're shopping for something because you're procrastinating, uh, you don't want to buy it because taking out a credit card is weird and your coworkers might see it, right? So then you go home and you try to buy it there, right? Facebook can actually join those two experiences because they know who you are in every computer that you've touched, right? And they can show you an ad when you're on the tube on the way home as well for that thing, trying to get you to induce you to buy it. And when you go and you buy it on your home machine, they can track it to the tube impression and to the work experience that you had and tie all of that together, right? And so Facebook actually knows who you are everywhere on the internet, right? And that, an immutable key for every consumer on the digital world is incredibly valuable. That is the marketer's holy grail. And that's what Facebook and maybe, you know, Google and Amazon to an extent have, right? So that's one piece of data that you give to Facebook that you don't really realize is important. Um, and then the microphone thing, so these computer theories start because people read the terms of service, which I'm sure n none of you have read, and maybe you should read or maybe you shouldn't. But um, if you read the terms of service, Facebook in theory can actually use your recorded conversations. That's right, actually. Um, but, <laughs> Um, just consider the computational challenge of literally snooping into every conversation and trying to extract, extract a certain topic, right? And think about how often do you say, hey, I want to fly to Hobart this Tuesday and I don't want to pay more than 200 bucks on June 6th, right? You never fucking say it, right? And the few times you do, you're saying it because you're saying, I already bought the ticket so it's no longer relevant, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so again, I, a lot of these conspiracy, I, I used to have to feel these conspiracy theories because as a targeting PM, they would bubble up to me. And it would always be some reporter who said, hey, I posted a photo of somebody where wearing a 49ers jersey, 49ers is the football team in San Francisco, and then that weekend I saw 49ers ads. Are you using image, are you using uploaded photos, right? And that person didn't think, well no, there was a game that weekend and you were geographically in San Francisco, which is what the targeting was, it had nothing to do with the photo they uploaded, right? But those are the sort of coincidences that people don't actually think about, so. It, again, I, I, and leaving all that aside, in this, in this ad tech story, right, between the advertiser, the agency, uh, various data service providers who, by, I don't know about here, but at least in the US, are hoarding all your consumer data, right? And then Facebook, between all those characters, Facebook is in fact your only friend, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the only company who actually gives a shit about you, right? Because believe it or not, Zuck doesn't give a shit about money, right? He doesn't care about money at all, right? But he does care about the Facebook user growth curve, right? And if he ever actually did anything that really pissed off users, like throw an election, for example, to the point where they stop using Facebook, then suddenly everything fucking changes, right? And so, in some sense, Facebook is your only ally, right? They're the ones that, in some sense, will be safeguard your data, right? I mean, Facebook, it's, it's weird. Facebook doesn't sell your data, by the way, okay? It doesn't sell your data. It buys your data, in a sense, because it provides services for advertisers to convince them to share their data with Facebook, because, the data that Facebook wants that doesn't have is what's inside your Amazon shopping cart. It's what you shopped at the electronics store or at Aldi's or whatever. It's what car you drive and how many miles it has. That's all the data Facebook wants but doesn't have and has to acquire by building technology. But anyhow, long answer to your short question. That's, the, that's how Facebook makes money. Um, it's not necessarily the data that you think it is in many ways.
and I'm losing my Brittany, which I think is what this mic is called. Hold on. <laughs> or so I was told. Okay, I got my Brittany back on. All right. I think you have to toss the thing to this Hi. guy. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, this guy. Thanks. Hi, just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention one big company, big G, Google. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are they facing the similar challenges, challenges as Facebook? And do you think that generally, I mean, you've been in financial uh, markets, uh, we are going to experience another, you know, dot-com bubble burst? Uh, the bur you know, I've been calling the top of the dot-com bubble for like five years, and I think it's probably s it's time to say that I'm wrong, or, or at least that, you know, I don't know. I've been calling it for five years, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, in terms of Google, I think the problems are not quite the same there. Um, well, yes and no. So where does Google's money come from? N yeah, right, obviously, but 90%, or, well, might be slightly less than that now, comes from search, right? So for all, all the weird shit, the self-driving cars, maps, all, Android, all that crap, it all comes from search, actually, right? But they, they do have a display uh, technology, right? So they run ads all over the internet. And so even if you don't use Google, they still make money, right? And so in some sense, they're a little bit hedged against that. It's still the case, by and large, that Facebook only makes money when you use Facebook, right? And that is kind of a risk. So if Facebook usage goes down, they're mon you know, it's monotonic with their actual monetization, that goes down, right? And so in that sense, Facebook has a risk that I think Google has slightly mitigated. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if Google search started not being used, that's the bulk of their business. But I think the lock in there is probably greater than it is with Facebook, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah. Oh. Uh, just a reaction to what you said earlier. Yeah. Maybe the Facebook killer is the, the service that uses your useless data. But oh. the question I have for you is um, more yeah. of a personal question. You seem like a pretty busy guy yeah. uh, working all the time. How do you justify that to your family and friends that you're oh. always busy and you're not, not with them? God, that so, uh, makes me feel terrible. I mean, it is true that in, it is true in, the, in the book. I mean, now it's not longer the case. I'm actually not that busy. But um, back in the day, I watched my daughter, that girl that you saw there, grow up through a Skype window because the office was in Mountain View. She was living. British trader was in Alameda. I didn't see the kid very often. Um, her first birthday, I had to miss it because that was the launch day for Agrock. And guess who won between Agrock and the girl? Agrock. And so, um, yeah, no, I, there's no way to justify it. I mean, Silicon Valley is insane. And it's, it's populated by... Glib, manipulative sociopaths who have, you know, have monetized their sociopathy via, you know, venture backing, and weighed into this pool for talent and whatever, right? I, yeah, it's hard to just. There's no justification for it. It's insane. That's all I can say. Yeah. I, I regret it in, in in retrospect, but yeah, but that's easy to say now. Yeah. Maybe we can take one last question. What time is it? No. All right. I knew oh. the Q and A would fill in the time. It's always <laughs> the Q and A always runs over. I don't know if you're familiar with that scenario. Uh, there's ideas of sort of uh, uh, blockchain-based, uh, sort of cryptocurrency-based uh, social media services, uh, okay. where it's, uh, you, you have your data, and now you can be paid for giving somebody your data. Oh, that's so a terrible what your idea. Your view is of that. I, mean, I think you basically answered it, perhaps already in yeah. your previous response. Uh, yeah. No. So. God, yeah. I think all those alternative ideas to advertising, and obviously I'm talking my book because I'm an ad tech guy, okay, but I'll just come out and say it. I think they're all f completely fucking full of shit for various reasons, and I'll tell you why. Ads need to exist for various reasons. Uh, one of the things I often hear is like, oh, you know what? I don't want to be tracked. I'm happy to pay Facebook 10 bucks or whatever, or whatever, right? Um, for starters, it's not even clear what Facebook would charge you, right? What is the point of ads? What is the point of ads? Other than paying for the internet, what is the point of, of, of an advertising business model? Well, part of it is like, what's the point of the exchange? It's a price discovery mechanism to figure out the value of your attention. That's the point, right? And so even if Facebook were to set a price for your attention, your annual use of Facebook, what would that number be? Because your value to Facebook is not the same as your value, and which is not the same as your value, say, in a market like India versus a market like the US, where the CPMs are you know, 20, 30 bucks, right? And the advertising system is what figures that out. And so there's no way you could just put a number on it, right? What are you going to do? Take your, your marginal usage of Facebook data and, and mark it up 20%? Facebook couldn't even figure that out, right? How much you cost to Facebook, right? There's, there's no notion of a cost of goods sold plus a margin in the digital media space. It just doesn't exist, right? Um, and so advertising is a way to figure out what to basically charge a user for that service, right? And the rea I mean, I, I don't understand blockchain really more than the average guy who's bought and sold Bitcoin, so I'm not even going to address the, the blockchain side of it, but just a general notion of I own my own data and I go out and sell it. For, you know, for starters, it wouldn't be worth that much to you, right? Like, the, a you know, the average monetization of a Facebook user, I mean, you could figure it out easily, right? They make, what, 20, 30 billion a year, and they've got 2 billion users, so it's 15 bucks a user per year on average. A lot more in first world countries. So, but w what are you going to do? Is that, you're just going to say 15 bucks, here it is? Again, you don't have a price discovery mechanism. You know what it is. And it's so little money that you wouldn't even bother. For 15 bucks, are you going to go through the bother of all this blockchain stuff? No, of course not. Right? So that's, that's the problem. Like, there's no other alternative to ads that pays for the internet as we know it. 
full stop. That's the reality, right? And so, you know, in my opinion, I know it's a little bit of an, of an ads Nazi thing, but if you use ads blocker, you're basically kind of stealing, right? You're like running the toll booth and the highway and saying, fuck you, I feel great doing it, right? It's like, well, but if you've actually worked on the publisher side and see how much, you know, just mental time and how many humans and how much hardware it actually takes to serve a quarter of the internet, you wouldn't feel so great about people who just flip off the toll booth and go through it because this, you know, fuck Facebook. It's like, well, it's not very nice, right? Let's, so, but again, I'm an ad man, so obviously I would think that, but yeah. It's a good question though, because I, I, yeah, I get asked it a lot of like, well, why ads, but yeah. yeah. All right, we will leave it at that. Okay, so cool. let's give Antonio a big round of applause. Well,